focusing on one thing this morning, and that, remember we talked about the idea of having our devotional, is to have a thought and, and to continue to, to understand who we are and whose we are so that uh, we, we walk on this earth with uh, the right mindset and the right disposition. And um, it says in verse 7 in chapter 3 in the book of Ephesians, in chapter 3, verse 7, it says this. This is Paul writing to the church in Ephesus. And he says, I became a servant of this gospel. And the gospel that he talks about is that gospel of the Christ, that fact, the fact that Christ came. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Okay, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll just focus in on one thought this morning. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. And so that, that's one of the things that Paul really focuses it on uh, is the idea of that who we are and whose we are is completely and utterly based on the grace of God that there's nothing that we have done to earn it. It's an unearnable gift. It's not possible to earn it. And um, that it was given to him, and he understands that this is the case. And, and who we are uh, is absolutely something. And, and there's, there's a treasure in that, in that there is no measurement that we ought to have that t asks us, well, have I done enough to earn this gift that God has given me? And yet there's a lot of Christians who, who struggle with that, uh, whether or not God accepts them. And, and I think a lot of that is based on this uh, meritocracy, um, the idea that you are uh, getting what you deserve or what you work hard for and certainly in certain aspects of life that's the case but paul uh, continues to write to help us to help us understand that it is not a uh, becoming a christian is not a meritocracy it's not something that you earn it's not based on your merits but it's based on grace so although i'm the less Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. I love the, the kind of adjectives that, that Paul uses to describe what we have in Christ. And, and the idea here is that the riches of Christ is boundless. You know, that talks about, there's one concept about God's faithfulness. It says that he is incapable of being faithless. That God is incapable of being unfaithful to us. In this case, it says his mercy, that, rather his riches, is boundless. There is no limit to it. Another part uh, in the Bible, it says God's grace is uh, mercies rather are new every morning and so the idea is that God is limitless he's not uh, bounded by anything but that's not what we're going to talk about this morning it says and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery which for ages was kept hidden who but kept hidden in God who created all things his intent was now that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. According to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now here it is. In him, that is Christ, and through faith in him, we, we may approach God with freedom, and confidence. I ask you therefore not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. Paul writes, and, and, and he says this idea that we can approach God 
with freedom and with confidence. Now, at times we have alluded to that in our prayers. You Sometimes when I pray to God, I, I say, in fact, God, we can approach your throne with confidence, not with trepidation, not with intimidation, not with a thought in the back of my head, am I righteous enough to approach God? Did I do enough to approach God? Did I share my faith enough? Am I reading the Bible enough? Is there a quid pro quo mentality in regard to God? Now, I'm going to ask him for something big. There's going to be a prayer request. So did I fast enough? Did I pray enough? Paul writes and he says, well, that's not how we approach God's grace, God's throne. The fact that we can approach God with freedom and with confidence. Need I remind you that before the cross and the administration of this, this grace that he's talking about, the idea of coming to God was the priest would come to God on your behalf, especially on the Day of Atonement. And what the priests would do, and particularly the high priest, he would uh, walk around the Ark of the Covenant and would make a sacrifice for the atonement of people's sins. And the idea here was, was an annual reminder, not that the actual sins would be forgiven, but it was a reminder of the fact that we are sinners, okay? That's part of the reason why we do the communion, right? And that's why sometimes someone shares about the communion, to generate a feeling that says, man, we were once sinners, but now we have been freed from sins. The atonement was, uh, was a reminder of the fact that they were sinners. And the high priest, not, not anybody could go before this ark and, 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 and approach this throne, if you would. And the high priest would go with the trepidation. So much trepidation is that if the, the high priest was not righteous, he would actually because go into the Holy of Holies, a special place, and he will fall dead if he was not right with God. It doesn't talk about, the idea of that is how righteous and holy God is. And they got to the point where they had the high priest having a bell around their ankle, walking around the Ark of the Covenant, to make sure that he was, so that people knew that he was still alive. There was a rope attached to him and a bell attached to him to make sure that that was the case. The Bible talks about the fact that God lived in an unapproachable light, that there was fear and trepidation. But on this side of the covenant, there is the idea that we can, cry out to God as our Father. That we can address Him as children of His. And that's one of the reasons why they, that in the time of Jesus, the, the Pharisees looked at Jesus and thought, what is, what is wrong with you? What do you mean you're calling God your Father? And in their minds, that when he was doing that, you can't address God as your father. That is blasphemous. In one of the places, it said that when you, when, you, when you call yourself the son of God, you are making yourself equal with God. But being on this side of the covenant, church, it is not based on our merits that we approach the throne of grace. And we do it not with our heads bowed down in a sense that, 
oh my gosh, I can't look up to God. We go down with our heads bowed down in reverence, yes, and respect of God if we want to. But the heart's disposition is freedom and confidence, not with a bell tied around our ankles, not with a rope attached to us just in case we're not ready. For Christ paid that price. That's what the grace of God is all about. And generally, there are two types of people in this world in regard to this. There are people who abuses that privilege, who abuses that mindset. And say, well, you see, because I can approach the throne of God with confidence and with, uh, I, I, and with freedom, it doesn't matter what I do, God's going to just be accepting me. Well, if you have children, you know that you will do anything for your children. But if your children act and do anything, then there are questions that you ask. And so you want to have this create this atmosphere of where your children can come to you with freedom and with confidence, but not abusive. That, that, that's, that's the whole goal. And then there are some people who just are afraid when they think about God and there is a trepidation. And that's why we can really, it doesn't matter what's going on in our lives from a physical mentality. When I say, that doesn't mean that we ignore our physical challenges at all. No, not at all. We're sick, we need to go to the doctor. But the idea of the totality of what's going to eventually happen to us, and because of living on this side of the cross, there is a freedom and a confidence that we carry our attitude, not an arrogance, not a holier than thou, not a I am better than you, but with a freedom and a confidence based on the fact that Christ has offered himself as an unblemished sacrifice. And I want us to reflect just for a few seconds here. Just think about it. What does it mean to you that you can approach God with freedom and with confidence? What does that mean? Are you one of those accused spirits that are wondering always, can I really, really address God? Can I really see him face to face? There are some images that are done in the scriptures that when Moses had to face God, he couldn't see him and God told him you need God had to turn his back because his face was so majestic. Their concept that no one has seen God because anyone who has seen God will fall dead. You can't see God. And now, on this side of the cross, on this side of the covenant, we can approach God calling him Father, Abba, Daddy, with freedom with confidence. What does that mean to you? The, the, the truth is, part of that is, is, is very reminiscent of what some people look at authority figures. I mean, it's relevant in the, especially with the racial tensions that's going on in our life and 
and the complaints that people of color or people um, who, who look at authority with a way that when there is a police officer or someone in authority, there is a trepidation. Yet there are some people who have no fear at all. Sometimes when they are doing something wrong. There are some people who actually stole, would steal a police car while they're being arrested. There are some people who are doing everything right, but sees a police officer and suddenly freezes. There's no confidence, there's no freedom. And the idea is, when we're talking about God, the greatest authority figure in this world, because of the death of Christ, we can approach him with freedom and with confidence. Let me ask you a question as you have thought about it for a few seconds. What does that mean? How, what does that mean to you 